Due to the global outbreak of the coronavirus, the Voice of America is taking every necessary precaution safeguard its employees, so our broadcast will look a little different today. And in the near future, as we reduce our staffing at VO headquarters here in Washington. We appreciate your staying with us on Straight Talk Africa. The coronavirus is bringing to the forefront the importance of the role of government's play in addressing a global pandemic. Africa has long struggled with governance issues but now citizens must rely on their elected leaders to protect them from the virus. In collaboration with NBS Television, a VOA affiliate in the Ugandan capital Kampala, here is VOA's Salem Solomon. As the world scrambled to battle a pandemic that is costing millions of lives and has already infected over 80,000 people in Africa, South African President Sarah Ramaphosa quickly stepped up the country's fight against the coronavirus. We are calling on all South Africans to wear a face mask whenever you leave home. Our clothing and textile industry, including small businesses, are gearing up to produce these masks on a mass scale. That wasn't the only bold measure Ramaphosa took. He called the military into action, ordering the deployment of 73,000 troops to enforce a lockdown. The country has also been aggressive in testing, accounting for about one-third of all coronavirus tests in Africa. It has the highest number of cases with more than 12,000 South Africans infected. The lockdown prompted protests and some deadly clashes with security forces. But after two weeks into the fight with the virus, Ramaphosa began to ease restrictions on May 13. On the other hand, Tanzanian President John Magufuli has focused his attention on different targets, public health officials and the international community. Magufuli, who used to teach chemistry, has been skeptical of the virus and has echoed conspiracy theories. On live television, he told the nation that the country's national laboratory had inflated coronavirus numbers. He even sent samples of fruit to be tested for the virus as a way to expose false positives. When we took a purple sample for a COVID-19 test, we labeled the sample as Elizabeth Ann, age 26, female. The result came out positive. This means those fluids inside the popo are coronavirus positive, something which is totally insane. The country has been criticized for its secrecy in reporting cases. Even the cause of death of the country's justice minister has been cloaked in mystery. While in Uganda, President Yuri Museveni said scientists had learned from past public health crises like AIDS and Ebola. The key, he said, is to determine the most common means of transmission and block it. On May 7, Uganda mandated that people wear masks in public. You have a mask because it is riding on the droplets, the breath of the infected person. Uh, if you block it, then you block it. That's why I would like you to, to put on the masks all the time. When asked about the health of the economy, the president assured Ugandans that his administration's priority is to save lives. There's no way you can compare that so many people should die so that we make money. No, <laughs> the money can wait. We shall money is there even tomorrow. So really, there's no comparison. You don't compare the uncomparables. There's no comparison. With life, we go for life first and then economy later will come later. Nigerian President Mohamedou Buhari has probably been touched more personally by coronavirus than any head of state. On April 17, his chief of staff died from the disease. Like other leaders, he enforced a lockdown but began easing it on May 4 in key areas including the capital Abuja and the largest city Lagos. Nigeria, Africa's most populous country, has the fifth highest number of coronavirus cases with just over 5,000. Buhari believes it is time to reopen key parts of the economy. 
the federal government shall deploy all the necessary human, material, and technical resources to support the state in controlling and containing the pandemic. These differing impacts in several countries highlight the health care needs and the importance of good leadership and strong government institutions when it comes to battling the pandemic. Solemn Solomon, VOA News, Washington. Thanks, Salim, for that report. Joining us today to talk about how African leaders are dealing with the coronavirus pandemic is Dr. Sion Filewo, emergency medicine physician in New York and advisor to the Minister of Health of Ethiopia, and Torba Tinyeswa, senior research associate at the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, I have to say that I'm profoundly honored and exceedingly humbled to have the opportunity to host the two of you on this special edition of Straight Talk Africa. Thank you for having us. Shaka, thank welcome. you. You're most welcome. It's nice to see you again, uh, Torbert. It's a privilege, yeah. Tell us uh, very, very briefly, how has been the response in Ethiopia by uh, uh, Abi Ahmed, the Ethiopian Prime Minister so far, when it comes to the coronavirus pandemic? Okay. So, you know, Ethiopia as an international hub and with flights from more, like different countries in the world, Ethiopia was one of the highest risk countries in Africa based on the prediction. And our first case in Ethiopia was reported mid-March. and. Within several weeks, actually, um, starting from early March, the government has taken serious measures such as uh, shutting down schools and also declared um, a state of emergency to prevent large gathering and congregations. And one of the, also the biggest measures that the government has taken in collaboration working with the religious institutions is to avoid um, congregations doing uh, the church holidays or uh, specific days that they would gather. So they would shut down most of the church so people could worship from home and um, avoid further gatherings. So that's been some of the measures that has been taken in Ethiopia. And most recently in the past uh, six weeks or so, I would say a lot of the flights that come from abroad have had to go through for all passengers to go through two weeks of an isolation and hotels and everybody gets tested. So in most of the cases that we've seen are positive cases of asymptomatic patients um, testing positive from people that have come in from abroad. So those are some of the serious measures that have been taken in Ethiopia. And this is in collaboration with multiple ministries under the guidance of the Ministry of Health. But these are some of the measures that have been taking place since uh, early March till now. I see. Uh, what about you, Torbat? Um, walk us through uh, some of the uh, significant uh, steps that have been taken by uh, the Liberian government under George Weah, the one-time soccer wizard. Right, one time legend. Uh, uh, thank you, Shaka. Uh, you know, the, the West African region, you know, was hit by the uh, devastation of uh, Ebola. Uh, Liberia, Guinea, and Sierra Leone uh, was like recovering from that huge uh, how outbreak that devastated uh, the region and how hit the economy, uh, ravaged the entire region, killed people, uh, close to 11,000 deaths in the region, uh, Manor River region. And COVID-19 has further exacerbated that situation and under the leadership of His Excellency President Weir took some, some stringent early measures. Before that, you know, uh, because the Ebola epidemic that happened between 2014, 2016, those countries have not let their gas down. And so they have been uh, preparing, doing airport screening. Uh, I, I was there quite recently, since I left Liberia in, in October when I heard the that's not Public Health Institute of Liberia that was established immediately after the Ebola crisis as part of building really the resilient 
healthcare system. And so echo screening was going on, surveillance system in every district in the country. So the government leverage infrastructures that were on the ground, President We are uh, also declared a state of emergency that is so synonymous and uh, to all of the countries in Africa. All the governments are declaring state of emergencies, stable actions, setting up emergency operations centers, incident management system to deal with the COVID-19 uh, outbreak. Sion, uh, if you were to talk to us about uh, your impressions so far, about how African in general has responded to the coronavirus. What would you say about it so far? You know, there were certain reports that came out yesterday in some archives that um, have described how most African nations have uh, responded to COVID-19. Um, some really good uh, early responses, um, like our colleague Dr. Tobit said, a lot of, especially the West African nations, the lessons from um, Ebola had, you know, uh, prepared them for this and taking stringent measures early on. And in Africa, as we know, um, because of, you know, the infrastructure of our healthcare system and not having the capacity to have the surge to build hospitals or ICUs overnight, uh, we recognize that prevention is the best mechanism for all of us in Africa. And if you look at it, most of um, the t actions taken on preventions were the screenings at the airport and also to avoid all the congregations. And in most of the African settings, we also have to think about the vulnerable population, so the poor people that really depend on the informal sector, and also um, to think about also our essential healthcare services. So the preventive um, measures taken so far, the stringent preventive measures that have been taking are very vital. Um, and, you know, I would probably argue that the reasons that we haven't seen that much of the spread of the disease to uh, deadly um, numbers are because of the stringent measures that have been taken so far. I understand that the flu season in some countries is coming up, so we might see the number spike to a scarier number. But I think most of the nations in Africa have taken um, a lot of the stringent measures, and mostly because we've been able to see how the disease has progressed in China and in Europe. So we had time to respond and learn from the other countries. And with the support of, you know, the WHO and the collaborative efforts of all the African nations, I think that has shown good result on the prevention. And I would say there's no time for complacency. I think a lot of people are probably tired of the stringent measures that are taking, people not being able to congregate. Uh, also, the law enforcement, the serious measures that have been taken. I think a lot of people are probably getting fed up with those measures, but that is the only mechanism, prevention is the only mechanism and the best mechanism that we have, especially in settings in sub-Saharan African countries. Sion, you know as well as I do that uh, not until recently, uh, the numbers of infected people in the United States seem to be very negligible. Not until the three words that are testing, testing, testing came up. Not until the United States really started very, very aggressively testing people that the numbers started spiking. How do, you, how do you respond to some observers of the African scene who have been saying that the reason probably we see very low numbers coming out of the mother African continent is precisely, in their view, not mine, because of inadequate healthcare infrastructure that will not allow testing, 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 and that therefore those numbers we are basically interacting with may not in fact be a reflection of the reality of the situation. Um, I think those criticisms are appropriate, and I, uh, from based on my experience in the USA, I will tell you, um, you know, a lot of the preparations were late uh, as far as um, the screenings, and even after the first few cases, uh, I would say a lot of the responses were not as vigilant. 
And even while we were seeing cases, even though it seemed like the testings were available, we at the hospital couldn't test because we didn't have the capacity. I would say a few weeks ago, um, for every patient that we admit, we were sending, I would say, five to six patients for every patient that we admit, five to six patients discharging from the hospital without testing. That's because we don't have the testing capacity. Now with the numbers of testing more increased, increasing in the U.S., we're testing more. And in the setting of African um, testing, I understand the criticisms, and it's important that we test more. You know, we don't know the exact numbers to be testing, but um, more, at least from my from the experience in Ethiopia, now the testing criteria have expanded. The community health workers, who are the backbone of our healthcare system, are doing house-to-house -house screening, any symptomatic patient testing them. And as we know, mostly a lot of the cases um, for the most sub saharan African countries are imported cases from abroad. So the screenings at the airports were very, very important. And now in the Ethiopian setting, we're testing everybody that arrives from um, abroad after isolating them for two weeks. So yes, I understand the testing capacity has to increase, but we also have to think of the African setting in general. Out of the population of 1.2 billion, um, how many, you know, how many people have the luxury of traveling and coming back? And also, if we see it the, in the African setting, a lot of the population that we have is under the age of 30. So most of the these people, as we know, as per as per the deaths that we've seen in COVID, it doesn't affect um, the young people. As, it's not as deadly as um, the virus, not as deadly on the younger patients that we've seen older patients. So we might not see that much death in the African setting, but again, we can never say never because this disease is. Um, changing as we learn, like as we see in the USA initially, you know, we were um, based on the Italy, the, based on the exclusion from Italy and China, it was killing a lot of people over the age of 60. But in the US, we've seen this, it's been killing patients in their, in their 30s and their 40s. Now, as of two days ago, as of a week ago, we're seeing in kids with this post-COVID infection, inflammatory syndromes that is affecting their heart, their lungs, and also their kidneys. So we don't know how this disease is going to evolve when it comes to Sub-Saharan Africa and also in some places in South America. So yes, we have to increase the testing, but because also the populations that we look at, uh, we don't have also the nursing home facilities that we've seen in the U.S. where when the disease lands in these facilities, assisted livings or where a lot of elderly patients or a lot of elderly patients live in, it will spread like a wildfire. So the disease might have not spread like a wildfire in some places. And also because of the demographic of Africa, most of the sub-Saharan Africa, it might not be as deadly. But again, it's we can't let our guards down because of that. But yes, for more testing. And also as a sub-Saharan African country, we might not have as much of the capacity to test like US or Europe or in China. But I think tracing, testing, tracing, and isolation is the bread and butter of public health and the support to contain the disease. Yes, you're right, uh, Sion, that uh, out of the 1.3 billion human beings on the African continent, perhaps not many of them have the ability to travel. But what about the fact that uh, the Chinese have the ability to do just that? The Chinese are all over the continent building stadiums, building railways, building roads, and doing a lot of other businesses. After all, how many people did it take to bring the coronavirus from Wuhan, the Chinese epicenter, to devastate Europe? Probably a couple of Europeans. Absolutely right, and that's why the screening at the airports, the travel history, and all the stringent screening that we're doing at the point of entry, whether it's airports or it's land borders, it remains very important. And it's not, I don't think that's only the action of the government. I think we've seen in some cases where people are trying to skip and find a way out of the screening mechanisms at the airport and the isolations and the quarantine. I think it's a responsibility of every individual that is respond that is traveling to go under this 14 days quarantine and get tested 
especially when the governments are trying to implement such programs and testing of the travelers is going to be very important in isolation of these travelers until they test negative. Interesting. What about you, uh, Torbat? Uh, what is your impression so far in terms of uh, how the various leaders on the continent are reacting and addressing the issues of the coronavirus pandemic on the continent? But I think my colleague, Dr. Sean, uh, alluded to some of the, the, the major issues and steps that have been, have been taken. Uh, from, from my experience dealing with uh, epidemics and, and outbreaks, uh, it's it too early to determine uh, what, what steps and what uh, impact those steps have made already. Uh, when you, you test, and the more people you test, that's how you know uh, where the disease is and how to find the disease and control the, the outbreak. Uh, right now, we are blindfolded. We do not know where the clusters of disease is. The more country, the country with more infections. I know there are some countries that have ramped up, uh, ramped up testing, like uh, Senegal has done a great job in our area by producing their own local test and uh, have done some, some quite number of, of testing in that area. In Kenya, they are doing the COVID-19 uh, tracker to make sure that the cases are tracked on a daily basis and daily reporting. Uh, you know, in Ghana, uh, there was the uh, lockdown measures that uh, His Excellency President Nana Kofuado took but later on in April was able to revise cost because of those measures. Uh, seems that uh, lockdown and some of the draconian uh, uh, controversial measures that were taken from the beginning could, could not work on the population. And so was able to lay the lockdown measure by doing a lot of testing. You find out that most of the countries with high number of cases, like I said, in Senegal, in Ghana, in South Africa, some of those countries are very good at doing testing. And uh, Shaka, as you said, testing, 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 contact tracing, isolation, social distancing, hand watching are the tools that we have in the tools bar right now to control COVID-19. And so countries that are doing high level testing and more testing are pat them on the back to continue that. That's the only way we know how the outbreak is proceeding based on the epidemiological trend, whether we are catching up with the curve, whether we are flattening the curve, whether we bend the curve and get to zero cases in Africa, that's how we can help the situation. I am totally uh, not pleased with some of the lockdown measures that African government are taking, governments are taking, and uh, some of them are, are really, really repressive. And I will encourage social distancing and all scientists and colleagues uh, in the public health field, we encourage social distancing as compared to locking down and putting on care fields that will terrorize our people. And so when president, the president of Ghana was able to do uh, lifting up uh, a lockdown to look for the disease, we should look for the disease, isolate the disease, stop the disease instead of isolating our people and then putting them in measures that put them in more poverty and have them uh, 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 full insecure and all of that. We know people cannot move around. Some of the challenges of combating COVID-19 in low middle income countries, especially in South, South Saharan Africa, is uh, issues like uh, weak surveillance systems. We are not detecting on time. Active syndrome surveillance to uh, uh, COVID-19 is Important countries may have difficulty in detecting the disease and responding to new cases of the disease, setting up incident management system as quickly as possible. Uh, significant high risk populations are some of the challenges, and this is why the population is already a high risk population. And then there are many people working in the informal sector depend on daily earnings and remote population and subjecting them to, to, to to the kind of measures that countries are proposing in Africa, I would think they would do proper community engagement because the poor people have access and vulnerability to what they're doing. 
uh, uh, some of the issues, challenges, and multiple generational housings that we have in our African cities are some of the challenges that people are having, limited health services. My colleague uh, alluded to that and talked about the, the, the uh, overwhelming of the health system. And what is, is, what is, is scaring and is concerning for Sub-Saharan Africa and for Africa is when we get to the worst case scenario. This is what uh, we really have to work hard to stop the disease to where it is right now. Because when we get to the level where thousands of cases being reported, I was looking at a case low of 70,000 on the continent. We're still in a better shape as compared to other countries in Europe, in the United States and North America, where we are right now. But when we get to the worst case scenario, where hospital systems are overwhelmed, no isolation facilities, we cannot have ventilators for the old people who will get into respiratory shock. This is where Africa will have more casualties, more mortality due to COVID-19 as it is right now. So African countries need to accelerate community engagement, community ownership, community participation, test the cases, isolate them, find the contacts, give people community food that are quarantined to have that bond. This is how we turned around the curve during Ebola when I was heading the national Ebola response effort in West Africa in Liberia. So by those measures of locking down, putting down curfew, are so repressive, the community might agitate, and then unrest and all of those things might come about. So African countries should be very, very careful by using disease outbreak response to political maneuvering that may cause an unrest on, on the continent. And, and reporting is critical. Data driven, science driven, the epidemiology of the disease, sugar is, 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 is very, very critical. When I hear about countries like Tanzania uh, with weeks and weeks of delay in reporting of cases, that is very, very much dangerous. I know uh, uh, His Excellency, the President of Tanzania, has been doing a very great job to move his people forward, but embrace the disease, take steps that will curb the outbreak bring down the cases, reduce the incident of the disease, work with the community, denial, there is no denial and resistance that the disease does not exist, will help the country. You will have your people, you cannot have an outbreak and an infectious disease. It will expose you. When people begin to die, there where you see that it can expose a health system or expose a country. So the continent is in a better shape right now, but more need to be exerted, as my colleague Sean was saying. Now, Siyod, uh, Torobot raises uh, several interesting points. But in particular, I would like you to address the issue of lockdown. What do you think about uh, these measures that require people to stay in their houses without an accompanying economic stimulus? Some would even prefer to say without an accompanying economic lifeline? So um, I think my colleague has outlined it very well. One thing, a few things I want to actually highlight according to lockdown is the um, consequences, especially the unintended consequences it will have on the, besides the economy, on also on other health measures, like our essential health care services. Uh, people, because of lockdown, we're seeing a sub saharan setting not going to their routine immunizations or not going for their uh, prenatal care. So because of that, what we've seen in West Africa, also because of Ebola, the spike, uh, because of the, there was a spike in maternal um, mortality and also child mortality, because indirectly, when you institute this uh, very stringent measures like lockdown, you're also decreasing access to essential healthcare services. Another thing, like we know, uh, when you institute such measures, the most vulnerable populations are going to have the brunt of the burden because they don't have the leisure of living off their savings. They don't have the leisure of um, getting support from family members because when people are really poor, they depend on the informal sections. And when you institute things like uh, a stringent lockdown, then people that live and dwell on 
informal sectors are going to get hit the hardest. So I think we need to find a balance because necessarily what has worked in Europe is not going to work in Africa because people can actually die from the consequences of the lockdowns because they don't have access to food, normal measures. They don't have access to immunizations. There was a report that came out three days ago, um, decreased access to HIV medications, TB and malaria are going to probably have more effect on the, on the continent because of uh, the lockdowns of COVID. And I think we really have to think about the how we proceed as sub-Saharan African nations because we need to find that balance in between. Um, and also, I understand um, my colleague has described some nations have you know started to open up and also find the middle ground for these things. I think we need to analyze. We want our leaders to um, do analysis on a regular basis to see if there's any effect. And of course, if the disease spreads like wildfire, this lockdown mechanisms have to be implemented. But you also have to think about how you support the most vulnerable population um, on the country. Another thing I think we almost never mention in some platforms are lockdowns. We've seen it also in, during the Ebola outbreak, the violence against women, the intimate partner violence, actually also increases during lockdown. So we also have to think about the most vulnerable population because people cannot get support from police enforcement, from, law, from the judicial system during this time. So we really have to think about the unintended consequences on women and also on the people that are going to suffer from violence at home. So I think in our, in our um, settings in sub-Saharan African nations, we really have to think about this and how we can support and find a system to support the most vulnerable population. And now I really worry about the uh, consequences that it will have from lack of immunizations and also contraceptive, all the essential healthcare services that people are lacking because they're either scared or because the lockdown mechanisms are not allowing them to go get access to essential healthcare services. As I often say, time is not our best ally. So we'll go for a break, and when we come back, we'll continue with the discussion. So please, don't go away. Health, wellness, sport, beauty, medical breakthroughs. Healthy Living cares about your well-being. Every week, connect with our experts. You can ask them your questions and get their advice. Join me, Lina Mudu, in Washington on Healthy Living, your new health program right here on Voice of America. Welcome back to a special edition of Straight Talk Africa. And our guests today are Dr. Sion Filewo and Nyeswa Torbat. Now, Sion, what about uh, the issue of hygiene? under uh, the lockdown conditions. There are reports, for example, from the Kenyan capital Nairobi, that an area known as Isiri, which is downtown Nairobi, uh, has been identified as a sort of hotspot. This is an area where many disadvantaged people, by that I mean economically disadvantaged people, live. But that this area has pretty much been cut off it has no access to water. It has no access to a lot of things that uh, contribute to life. When you think about uh, these messages that uh, you should wash your hands every 30 minutes and with soap, you are talking about an area here, one, where there is no access to water, where people might find it very difficult to even access soap. How do you go about those types of hygiene issues under these types of lockdown measures? Um, I definitely understand, especially with those measures, like I said earlier, um, most of what we institute does not going to necessarily work with the most vulnerable, with the most vulnerable and people with low income. Not only with hygiene, but also with living situations. People are multi-generational family living in a cramped house where you can't tell them to social or physical distance. So it's a triple burden, lack of access to water, lack of 
a space to uh, distance from your family members and all of those. And I, I think from what we've seen in most of uh, the other the responses in other countries, I think most countries and most governments are trying to enhance the system. For example, I see actually this um, whole COVID-19 outbreak as an opportunity for capacity building. If there's a way some countries could focus on providing water to these places, especially whether they have a COVID outbreak or not, I think this is a way how we can build our system in one of the poorest places that, um, especially within the, in the slums and in the cities and where a lot of people do not have access to basic uh, sanitary products and water. And also, I think when you design uh, an intervention or a public health system trying to implement, you have to focus on the most vulnerable population trying to amplify because you have to double your efforts in this population or else it's going to spread like a wildfire. The way I've described it here in New York and some places, especially in places with lower income and people have to live uh, with multiple generations of family in a cramp, it just felt like a COVID-19 bomb hit and it spread like a wildfire. And I'm also very scared and anxious about how that might be the case in most of our um, the city settings and the slums and sub-Saharan Africa. Once the disease spreads between two, three family, it's just going to spread like a wildfire. So the efforts have to be double, triple, and also find a way to build a long-lasting system because of the COVID-19 response. Robert, uh, talk to us about uh, the key role that uh, you played during the days that uh, you were fighting um, against the Ebola. What is the significant difference between that type of fighting and this type of fighting around the coronavirus? What is the difference between the coronavirus issues and what you met? and what you learned out of fighting the Ebola disease. Okay, thank you. Uh, the, the Ebola had uh, infectious uh, diseases that cause havoc on the human population. Uh, similarities is that they all generated from the animal population and uh, affecting human, there is something, there's a concept we call the, the One Health approach interaction between human animal in the, in the environment, we, we, we saw evidence that uh, Ebola was caused by, by bats. I, I done a study work with a team from Columbia University in the United States, and we were, were testing bats in Liberia. We test about 10,000 bats, and in one of our provinces, our county in the north, we found that one of the bats were having the RNA of Ebola. But the link between the whether or not that was the cause of the outbreak was not uh, proven evidently because the outbreak came from uh, the Ebola outbreak of 2014-2016 came from the northern part of our country from Guinea between 2013-2014 and we had the outbreak. And the, the Wuhan uh, COVID-19 outbreak from Wuhan, China is also, uh, there is, there is the, the proposition that is also originated from bats and other animals in the Wuhan market in China. So we're dealing with uh, diseases from animals that are affecting humans. And this came from far back from the days of influenza diseases, like we were dealing with the 1918, 1919 uh, Spanish flu that killed more than 50 million people and other outbreaks that have occurred. The Ebola virus disease, as you know, in West Africa that ravaged the, the that ravaged Red Africa before WHO declared that outbreak over from the human population. We had 28,000 infected people in the most the three most affected countries, Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone. I mentioned that earlier. And that outbreak was so devastating to the effect that a lot of people got infected and killed. From my own country alone, we had close to 4,800 people uh, uh, that died from the disease. And the government then, under the leadership of President Sergei, had to take some very, very stringent, very, very uh, cold 
actions that that really led to the, the to limiting the number of deaths and cases that were that were projected from from the disease. There was projection from the US CDC and WHO between 2014 and 2015 September to January that the region would have would have received or experienced 1 million cases and close to 200,000 people were going to die from Ebola. But because of the measures that we took, uh, the president called on technician scientists to work and set up a system. I was put in charge of the incident management system for the Ebola response. When the situation was already in a dire need, when we were in the peak, real peak, the dark days of the Ebola crisis, people were dying in the streets because uh, there were lack of treatment beds. We didn't have the significant beds. And this is why uh, I, was, I was talking about Africa should not get to the worst case scenario that we saw in Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone. People were dying in the streets. There were strict uh, uh, deprivation. Uh, uh, treatment units were filled in the country. Their body management was challenging. Healthcare system collapsed. And, and my colleague was telling you about how we can leverage, respond to outbreaks, and also keep the normal and routine healthcare services working. It is very, very much important. You don't want to compromise and uh, only concentrate on dealing with an outbreak and immunization services, maternal and child health services, nutrition services, providing routine care systems, supply chain services, healthcare workers. Liberia healthcare system came to near collapse. Hospital closed down, 192 healthcare workers died. We had uh, uh, Ebola treatment units had to be built we have to ramp up the uh, uh, safe and dignified barrier teams, social mobilization, community engagement, uh, train healthcare workers to man treatment unit and at the same time reopen the healthcare system. That's how devastating the situation was when we took charge of the incident management system and we built the, the pillars around the incident management system. Put in place people that were doing case management put in place contact tracer, isolation units, uh, recruit contact tracers and train them, epidemiological system, their body management team, and then routine healthcare system. The, the thing we did was we hired technical qualified professionals librarians that the United Nations and other partners were playing the core lead of the incident management system. That's how we were able to bring the outbreak. And Liberia was able to get to zero uh, when I took over in August of 2014. Within two to three months, Liberia bent the curve. And by January, uh, May 2015, Liberia was declared Ebola free. Though we had some flare ups, there were two or three flare ups of the Ebola virus disease. And then some of the lessons that Liberia learned, and some of the things that make us to turn around the curve in Liberia was engaging the community. This is why community engagement is critical. The disease is in the community. Governments should work with community people. When you close them down, you shut them down, you oppress them, you don't want them to speak out, then to defeat the purpose of fighting the virus. The countries in Africa are not having security threats from armed conflicts. You're having health emergency. And so deal with the community, work with them, change their behavior, isolate the sick, trace their contact, carry on hygiene, give them food. These are the services the government, the people need from the government at this stage. COVID-19, we can do the same because the reason responding to COVID-19 and Ebola could be the same, though not one size fit all, is that there are no vaccines, there are not no therapeutics, with Ebola the same, COVID-19 the same, because COVID-19 is a new disease that we're dealing with. The only difference is the transmission and the mode of transmission and how people get the disease. With Ebola, it was physical touch. With COVID-19, someone 
in six feet distance can give you the disease. And this is why social distancing is very, very much important. Hand watching, wearing masks with COVID-19, those are the measures that we need to take. But actually, the response mechanism should actually be the same. Test, contact trace, isolate people, community engagement, social mobilization, provide them with the support until the permanent solution, which is the primary solution of preventing any disease, we can get the arrival of vaccines or therapeutics. That's how we dealt with Ebola. We got to zero. We built healthcare systems in the country that government, our government was able to tap on. And not only in Liberia, but in the West Africa region, then you have the African region where the Africa CDC came from out of the Ebola crisis that is now leading Africa's response. The Africa Center for Disease Control have been doing a terrific job under the leadership of John, and I've been following them very much, part of some of the webinar and providing technical support from the, from the distance in the United States. But uh, Africa CDC has been playing a significant role in building some of the surveillance testing laboratory and all of that. Well, Dr. Sione, I'm, af I'm, I'm afraid that, uh, yes. I'm afraid that uh, you have to leave, but could I ask you the last question, if you don't mind? Okay. It is a question that uh, eventually Robert will come to, because uh, he seems to think that uh, when you look at uh, the coronavirus and you look at uh, the previous Ebola disease, they are significantly not very, very different. But what about uh, the fact that, for example, when it came to Ebola, you were talking about um, an epidemic disease here. When you talk about uh, the coronavirus, you are talking about a pandemic. For our average audience, what is the difference between an epidemic and a pandemic? Okay. So I would say uh, the epidemic is when you, from what we've seen like Ebola, that is localized to certain countries or certain areas. And for the pandemic as well as actually gone to multiple continents, what we've seen from Asia to Europe and then from Europe now to the Americas and also to Africa. So it's a, it's a progression that affects all over the world. And Along with that, actually, I want to also pass this message. I think some places, as we've seen, um, they they seem to work in silos. It's the important thing when it comes to pandemic and also even epidemics, because what we've seen from Ebola, Ebola could have spread to several other countries, several other continents, and it could have become a pandemic. But what has worked then is the coordination and also the collaborative efforts and the solidarity, as well as help from the disease from spreading to other parts of the world. And also, just like my colleague Dr. Tober explained it, you've seen it, the infectivity of the disease, the way how it spread when it comes to COVID-19, you have to be within more than six feet apart. And the way it spread is much more rapidly compared to the Ebola virus. And because of that, I think that has served some advantage for Ebola not to spread like a wildfire to certain areas. But one thing that has saved us for sure is a collaborative effort. All countries, this multilateral collaborative effort has helped from the disease to come from becoming a pandemic. But now with COVID-19 as a pandemic, it's still important more than ever that we work together as a country, collaborate with uh, the WHO, with African CDC, and that everybody shares their information in a transparent way. Because if we can't, if we can't contain it everywhere in the world, this disease is not going to go anywhere. The disease still spreads in certain countries. Every country, every nation is at a risk of getting the disease. So it's very important that we work in a collaborative effort, solidarity, that our responses are coordinated. If that's not the case, we can't win this fight. It's very, very important that we continue to work in a coordinated manner, especially in sub-Saharan African setting. And in that context, uh, I hope you will find some space in your beautiful Ethiopian heart to forgive me for this. What is an endemic? An endemic is when that disease is only... Um, is only pertinent to those countries. For example, like when we see in malaria hit areas, 
those places where the countries have not been able to um, uh, contain the disease or eradicate the disease, those places are considered endemic, meaning it's only specific to that nation and to that specific country. So um, more like malaria, you don't see it in most of the other parts of the world, especially in double countries, because of a better infrastructure, they've been able to eradicate it. You know, many, many, many years ago, malaria used to be a disease and, and most of the countries in, in South America and, and the USA. So it's not an endemic disease anymore, but like malaria and now some t uh, TB and other diseases have become an endemic because our infrastructure has not been able to eradicate it. Well, on that note, uh, Sion, um, I hate to say this, uh, but uh, it's been a pleasure interacting with you, and I certainly look forward to some day when the situation becomes a little bit normal to host you in the studios of Straight Talk Africa, either in Washington or New York. Thank you for having me. You're most welcome. Now, Torbert, let me come to you immediately. Um, I deliberately asked for those definitions because it leads me to a very important question that I have for you. There is a saying that uh, to whom much is given, more is expected. You talked about uh, how the healthcare infrastructure in your country of Liberia and indeed the West African region almost collapsed. And it probably could have collapsed, but because you were able to get some support, to get some help from, for example, I remember the United States of America under the Barack Obama administration. But I think in this particular case that might be very difficult because you were dealing at that time with a disease that was a disease that was an epidemic. But we now deal with another disease, the coronavirus pandemic happens to be an you know happens to be a pandemic, meaning which is being fought on all fronts throughout the world. Couldn't this perhaps be a significant difference between fighting the corona virus as we have to, as compared to the Ebola disease that you fought several years ago. Because the people that would, would provide some resources for fighting some of these diseases, for example, on the continent, are in the business of fighting on their own territory. Thank you. I think that that's a very, very important uh, question that you raised. Uh, let me, before I come to that, let me uh, uh, tell you about some of the critical uh, differences between uh, coronavirus disease and the Ebola virus disease that we were, we were dealing with. Uh, one of the things, there is something called a case fatality rate of a disease. Uh, meaning the number of people that are confirmed or infected with the disease, the percent of them that will die from the disease. Ebola, before the outbreak was declared over, the 2014, 2016 outbreak was declared over, there was 50% case fatality rate, meaning people that were confined of the disease, that caught the disease, 50% of them died from the disease. That was the case fatality rate at the time. The case fatality rate, on the other hand, with COVID-19, is very, very low. Now, on the average, on the African continent, we're talking about 3.4% to 4%. In other countries, it's less than 1%. In other countries, it's 2%. So if you compare it with that huge gap of the, the severity of the disease based on the number of people it will kill, Ebola was killing faster and more people. Uh, uh, in terms of the case fatality rate as compared to COVID-19. This is why it is essential. People in Africa and across the world listening to me, there is no reason to hide and stigmatize 
people with COVID-19. There's another research that shows that from WHO that 80% of the people, whether or not even you caught COVID-19 and did not go to seek health care, will survive. So why will you be afraid of a disease that will not kill you immediately, like the way Ebola was doing? So I just wanted to give you some of the similarities and dissimilarity between the, the two diseases that we are dealing with today. On the question as to, to much is giving, much is expected, Ebola, time is important in an outbreak response. Time is very, very much critical, my brother. The reason time is critical is WHO in six months, six to eight months of the outbreak, in August 11, precisely of uh, August 8, 2014, an outbreak that started in 2013 in Guinea, an outbreak that started in Liberia in March of 2014, WHO declared a public health emergency of international concern for Ebola in August. Six or seven months later before a public health emergency of international concern was declared, that delay caused a lot of lives lost. This is why there was a lot of recommendation. I was on some panel that looked at the future pandemic, and this is the pandemic that we're in right now, as to what happened in Ebola with some of the delays that caused people to die. Time is very much important. The time you take to, number one, detect an outbreak, the surveillance system you set up, and how you respond will shut down the outbreak and curtail the number of casualties and deaths and sickness and infection from that disease. The world trooped on West Africa. The goal of the Obama administration was, and not only President Obama alone, but the United Nations, as you know, the United Nations under the Secretary General Dan Ban Ki-moon passed a Security Council resolution that we should not isolate the people of West Africa, but let go there and stop the disease. So everybody was focused on West Africa. If we didn't do that, or the world did not do that, Ebola would have been a pandemic as COVID-19 is today. What, do I, what am I setting the premise? COVID-19. The world should have focused on Wuhan in China and stop the outbreak right in China at that province. But there were a lot of missteps that got the disease out of control, out of from government failures, out of from uh, uh, the international cooperation, coordination, did not come together that we saw Ebola that made now we are over 188 countries and 4 million cases of the disease, over uh, uh, 300 to 400,000 deaths are now occurring in the country. That's what made, to my, to my opinion, there was little response to the outbreak. World leaders should have come together to move very quickly, decisively, working with the Chinese government to stop the outbreak in Wuhan so that it, it did not get out of control. And this is why we are concerned uh, in the scientific and public health community that African countries need to work aggressively because if the worst case scenario occurs in Africa, it will be devastating. I'm afraid to talk, but my boss is telling me that uh, time is out. Okay, great. I certainly look forward to hosting you live from the studios when we return to back to normal say. Thank you. Thank you, Shakat. On that note, our two distinguished guests were Dr. Sion Filewo, who joined us earlier, and Inyeswa Torbat. In the meantime, get better, not better, Africa, and please, please, Let's keep the African hopes alive.